thousand devils by all the fires of hell and darkness give strength and life to this your creature Minaton Minaton Nineteen seventy seven saw the release of the third movie in the Sinbad series, which had started with the seventh voyage of Sinbad way back in nineteen fifty eight. Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger arrived on the shores of the UK in July, making its way across the Atlantic to the USA on August the twelfth later that year. After the strong box office success of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad in nineteen seventy three, Columbia Pictures executives began work on a third Sinbad motion picture, whilst the Golden Voyage was still in its theatrical release. Produced by Charles H. Schneer and Ray Harryhausen, who had a prolific working partnership which started with It Came From Beneath the Sea in 1955. The film went into production under the working title Sinbad at World's End. Jason and the Argonaut screenwriter Beverly Cross wrote the screenplay along with story elements provided by Harryhausen, Beverly better known as Alan Cross, the husband of Dame Maggie Smith. He went on to write the script for Clash of the Titans. Beverly created several drafts for Sinbad. Sinbad in Hyperborea and Sinbad Beyond the North Wind were other titles considered. With a budget of $3.5 million, this was the most expensive of the series. It was also the second costliest of the Schneer and Harryhausen films, behind their next and last film, Clash of the Titans in 1981, which cost $15 million. The Eye of the Tiger was a moderate success, taking overall $20 million at the box office. As Star Wars was released just three months before this film, The Eye of the Tiger lost out to Star Wars Fever, potentially affecting its box office results. In the Kingdom of Shirak, a celebration is taking place for the coronation of Prince Kazim, but Kazim's evil stepmother, Zenobia, places a curse on him and turns Kazim into a baboon, just as he was going to be Crown Caliph. Sinbad's sailor and prince of Baghdad moors at Shirak, intent on seeking permission from the prince to marry his sister, Princess Farah. Sinbad finds the city under curfew. When he and his men shelter in a nearby tent, one is poisoned and the rest are attacked by Rafi, Zenobia's son. But Sinbad defeats him, soon a witch summons up a trio of ghouls which emerge from a fire and attack. Sinbad fends off the ghouls and makes his escape. After his escape, Sinbad meets with Farah, who believes that Kazim's curse is one of Zenobia's spells, and if Kazim cannot regain his human form within seven moons, then Zenobia's son will become Caliph instead. In Farah's excitement and loathing for her stepmother, she lets slip of their plans to search for a cure for Kazim. Sinbad, Farah, and the baboon Kazim set off to find the old Greek alchemist named Melanthius, a hermit on the island of Kazgar. Zenobia and Rafi follow in a boat propelled by the Minotaur, a magical bronze automaton created by the sorceress that looks like a minotaur. Sinbad and Farah land at Kazgar and find Melanthius and his daughter, Ione, who agree to help him. Melanthius says they must travel to the land of Hyperborea, where an ancient civilization once existed. Sinbad and company must battle their way to the Arctic, fending off a giant walrus, ice and snowstorms to reach the Shrine of the Four Elements, in order to lift the spell on Kazim. The movie's cast has Patrick Wayne in the role of Sinbad. John Philip Law was originally set to reprise the role of Sinbad from The Golden Voyage, but wasn't able to commit. Wayne's casting was announced in May 1975. Wayne is the son of Hollywood legend John Wayne. He started his career starring alongside his father in movies at a young age. According to Ray Harryhausen's memoirs, British singer-actor Paul Jones was amongst the various British and American actors shortlisted for Sinbad. That also included Michael York, Timothy Dalton and Michael Douglas. Patrick Troughton stars as the wise Greek sage Melanthius. This was Patrick's second Harry Harryhausen movie, previously playing the blind Venus in the 1963 film Jason and the Argonauts. Patrick's co-star on that film, Lawrence Nailsmith, was first choice for the role of Melanthius, but was unable due to other commitments. Patrick should need no introduction as he starred as the second incarnation of the Doctor in Doctor Who. 
This is a second Sinbad film to have an actor who has played the Doctor. Tom Baker appeared in The Golden Voyage right before becoming the Doctor. Troughton was also known for starring in the Richard Donner's The Omen in 1976. Taryn Power stars as Dione. Taryn was the daughter of the late classic Hollywood star Tyrone Power. Charles Neer thought there would be some chemistry with John Wayne's son and Tyrone Power's daughter. Taryn only had a limited career in the film industry and wasn't really interested in furthering her acting career, only starring in a few productions after this. Jane Seymour stars as Princess Farrah. Jane came to stardom as Solitaire in Roger Moore's first outing as James Bond in Live and Let Die 1973. Jane didn't really have a great time on the movie due to the politics on set. Her role was effectively cut in half to accommodate a part for Taryn Power. Jane would go on to star in Battlestar Galactica and have a long, successful career in Hollywood. Kurt Christian, who played one of Sinbad's men in The Golden Voyager Sinbad, switched sides and played Zenobia's son, Raffi. Margaret Whiting stars as Zenobia. Margaret was a seasoned TV and stage performer, mainly starring in one-off roles in British TV dramas. Hollywood legend Betty Davis was also considered for this role, however her fee proved too high, and she also demanded a percentage of the box office. Nadim Sawala plays Hassan. Nadim is a British character actor, and is the father of British stars Julia and Nadine Sawala. Damien Thomas stars as Kasim, who is transformed into a baboon. Ray Harryhausen was forced to create a mechanical baboon. An actual baboon would have been difficult, if not impossible, to train. Damien, another British actor, only had a small role in the film. He later had success with the renowned NBC drama Shogun in 1980. Legendary performer Peter Mayhew made an uncredited acting debut in the film in some live action sequences as the Minotaur, mainly in close ups and long distance shots. This was Mayhew's very first role, right before his more famous role of Chewbacca in Star Wars. He was cast after Charles Schneer spotted his photo of him towering above his colleagues. Back in London, Stuart Freeborn was looking for a performer to play the role as the mighty Chewbacca and had spotted Peter on set. He offered Peter the role on the recommendation of Ray Harryhausen. The movie was directed by Sam Wanamaker. Schneer had worked with Sam on The Executioner and hired him for this because he wanted an actor's director for The Eye of the Tiger to see if he could get more dimensions out of the otherwise cardboard characters. Sam didn't have to handle any of the technical aspects of the picture. The technical work was carried out by Harry Hausen and Schneer. Sam was an American actor who moved to the UK. His main passion was for the theatre, and one of his achievements was saving the theatre that became Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London. Sam is the father of actress Zoe Wanamaker, and guess many of you will recognise Sam from his role as the media mogul David Warfield from Superman IV The Quest for Peace. The principal filming took place between June and October 1975. The live action was filmed in Almeria, Spain, Malta and Jordan. The treasury house at Petra makes an appearance in one scene. This was used later as the home of the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade in 1989. Several castles near Malta were used as backdrops for the film and inserted using triple exposure, and scenes of the ships at sea were filmed in a huge water tank there. Most interior sequences were shot on a soundstage at Verona Studios near Madrid, and also in the UK at Pinewood and Shepton Studios. Some sets were based on previous films. Harryhausen referenced the movie that inspired him, with the massive doors and deadbolt, to the ancient shrine of the Arimaspai in the Arctic, were based on a similar set of the doors in the 1933's King Kong. The interior of the shrine was very similar to the shrine set in the 1935 motion picture She, complete with steep steps, a vortex of light coming from above, and a saber-toothed tiger encased in ice. The movie's beautiful score was composed by British jazz musician Roy Budd. Roy was highly talented and studied the work of John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith at a young age. He would go on to provide scores for movies like The Wild Geese and its sequel. However, Roy's most famous work is for the score for the 1971 Michael Caine movie Get Carter, where he achieved critical acclaim at a young age, only being in his early 20s at the time. Roy composed a beautiful score for Sinbad and provides all the majestic hues and themes that sum up an Arabian adventure given great themes for each character. The one for the baboon is one of my personal favourite parts of the score. Roy tragically died suddenly in 1993 at the age of 46. A great shame as he was one of Britain's leading composers and a very talented musician. Cinematography was overseen by Ted Moore. Ted was a renowned British cinematographer working on all the early Bond films, including Live and Let Die working with Jane Seymour. He also worked with Schneer and Harry Harrison on The Golden Voyager Sinbad and later went on to work on Clash of the Titans. Visual effects were of course overseen by Harry Housen, but future Oscar winning effects artist Colin Shilvers, who won an Oscar later for his work on 1978's Superman the Movie, and Inception Oscar winner Chris Colbold, both uncredited, contributed to the movie's effects. 
The power source of the Shrine of the Iron Mask Pie was actually made of dental floss. Harry Hansen and the crew mounted dozens of floss fiber strands around a cylinder maze of gauze, and this was mounted on a revolving mechanism and put in front of black velvet. Harry Hansen also said that he planned to have Sinbad and his crew fight a Yeti in the Arctic, but this idea was ultimately rejected in favor of a giant walrus. Other Harry Hansen ideas were of a woolly mammoth as a creature in the Arctic, and a clash between the troglodyte and the minotaur in the ancient shrine was also considered, but a saber-toothed tiger was picked instead. After the live-action filming was done, it took animator Ray Harry Hansen almost one and a half years to do the animation, all from his own home studio, lasting from October 1975 up until March 1977. The stop-motion troglodyte figurine used in this film was later cannibalized to make the Calabos figure in Clash of the Titans. The troglodyte was designed originally for the Guardian of Good in the previous film, The Golden Voyager Sinbad, but was ultimately replaced by a griffin. An actor in makeup was originally to play the troglodyte, but Harryhausen said that he was striving for that fantasy effect that King Kong had, that wonderful Never Never Land of fantasy, so he created the creature himself. The costume was tested on location, however, and was another role that Peter Mayhew was used for. It's said for the keen eye that one shot makes it into the movie of the test troglodyte. Ray Harryhausen's movies were, like many, a huge part of my childhood. Jason and the Argonauts, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, were shown regularly on British TV every Christmas and Easter. They were essential viewing, so I was very familiar with his work. Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger was the first one I was able to view at the cinema. My parents took me to the cinema at a very early age, so it's quite possible I watched this in 1977. However, I think it's more likely I watched it when it was re-released with the CBS TV pilot for The Amazing Spider-Man that had a cinematic release here in the UK in December 1978 that was shown as a double bill with Sinbad. I actually adored this movie as a kid. I had a recorded copy from TV on Betamac that I watched many, many times. I haven't watched it in years. These films are rarely shown on TV anymore, so I was a little apprehensive. Watching it preparing for this review, I wasn't too disappointed. I actually loved reliving moments I'd loved as a kid. Of course, this movie is 43 years old, so there are things I didn't notice or care about when I was younger. The plot and story are a little thin, with telling some story elements from early Harry Harryhausen films. The ghoul attack, for example, is reminiscent of the skeletons from Jason and the Argonauts, mixed with the alien selenites from the earlier First Man in the Moon. The acting is inconsistent. Patrick Wayne has had a lot of flack for his performance, but I think he does an okay job as Sinbad. He plays it all American hero. The problem is, is Sinbad isn't given a lot to do. Jane Seymour's performances are not great. I think she may have been so disappointed to have her role cut. This comes across in some scenes and has little to no chemistry with Patrick Wayne. Patrick Troughton steals the show for me. He's a cross between Gandalf and the Doctor and a joy to watch. I've always loved his Doctor, so it was an easy win for me. What do you got in there? Tell me. It's a cage holding a... Wait, don't tell me. It's an arboreal anthropoid of the genus Papio. No, it's a baboon. <laughs> so I said a baboon. Magic White in Zenobi is more pantomime villain than I remember. However, she was nominated for a Saturn Award for Best Supporting Actress for this role. The standout performance in the whole movie is Harry Harryhausen's baboon. He gives it such emotion. Some viewers at the time thought it was a real baboon. The scene where Kasim looks at himself in the mirror for the first time is filled with emotion. It's a credit to Harry Harryhausen's skill. The troglodyte is another triumph. The sadness and curiosity in his face is exceptional, which, spoilers, makes his fate very heartfelt and saddening. Not all his creations are a success though, the Minotaur is a fantastic design. He and the giant Hornet don't have the same impact as the rest. Harry Harryhausen said later this was due to the project being rushed into production, leaving little time for character development. Not all the effects have stood the test of time, in particular Petra and Jordan is particularly problematic, as it's obvious that a second unit visited the location to gain the shots and background plates. None of the principal cast were on location, so stand-ins were used. This is common practice to save time and probably for budget reasons meant the cast would have performed their parts in the studio and the background would have been composited in later, resulted in some very poor results and poorly edited with some real bizarre close-ups, probably to hide the background. 
When approaching the castle of Melanthius, the obvious standard for Jane Seymour wears a green dress, while Seymour's appears blue, possibly down to problems with processing as colours often fade, greens become grey or blue. One particular matte painting in Hyperborea also looks poor. The walrus attack in the Arctic is played with an overuse of composited snow, probably to hide the fact that this was shot in 100 degree heat on location in Spain. The poor cast acting in untreated real furs, according to Jane Seymour, created a real unbearable smell. Critics did praise the fight between the troglodyte and the saber-toothed tiger, saying it was better choreographed than the fight between the centaur and the griffin in the previous movie, the saber-tooth inflicting some real damage to the poor troglodyte. The Eye of the Tiger suffers as being cast off as the weakest Sinbad movie. It was bookended by the slightly superior Golden Voyage and the much, much more expensive Clash of the Titans, so it's kind of cast aside, which is a real shame. Despite its flaws, it's still an enjoyable adventure. There was talk of another sequel in 1981, Sinbad and the Seven Wonders of the World was considered too expensive after the high cost of the Clash of the Titans. Sinbad Goes to Mars was remarkably another story idea that was considered a John Carter of Mars take on Sinbad, probably to compete with the huge sci-fi trend at the time. I highly recommend Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, it's a nostalgia trip for me. It may not be the best Sinbad movie, but for me will always remain my favourite. If you want to watch, there's a great Blu-ray by Powerhouse on the indicator label, or it's available to watch on Prime Video. There's no doubt in Ray Harryhausen's legacy and his contribution to modern cinema. After all, a host of the best directors and effects artists have been inspired by his work. All of his movies should be enjoyed for generations to come, and not just by fans who know of his work. His movies were the blueprint for modern animation, and not all have the charm of his work. In this age of photorealistic CGI, remake of Clash of the Titans and its sequel clearly demonstrate that. It's refreshing to relive the wonderful world of Dynamation, and as Harry Housen stated, that wonderful Never Never Land of Fantasy. There's a certain childlike quality I think one has to maintain uh, for the love of a fairy tale, for the love of a fantasy. Please consider subscribing, and if you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up and check out my other reviews. Click on the links below. Thanks a lot, and I'll catch you on my next review. Take care, and speak soon.